Starting your own practice is hard for many chiropractors. It's riddled with both struggles and successes. But here at the Chiropractic Philanthropist, we make it easy by having chiropreneurs and entrepreneurs share their struggles and lessons learned in life and business so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. And now, here's your host, Dr. Ed Osborne. How amazing would it be if you could practice because you want to, not because you have to? Learn how to improve your cash flow and increase your passive income now. Go to moneyripples.com or find their podcast, The Chris Miles Money Show, to learn more. All right, TCP listeners, I have an incredible guest today, and that is actually Dr. Noel Lloyd. Dr. Noel, how are you doing today? Doing great. How about you? I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm actually really excited for this because, you know, I feel like this has been in the process for like a year now. So we finally get to have this conversation. Right. We've, we've got some extra time uh, courtesy of the virus, right? <laughs> everyone, hopefully everyone has a little extra time too. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I know you, I mean, I've been doing a bunch of research and, and looking to see, you know, more about you. I've been following you on social media as, actually for many, many months but for those of the, the listeners who don't know who you are, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and how you're one of our leaders in, a, in the profession today? Well, I've been a chiropractor for almost 50 years. I graduated in 1971. And so next year, we'll, I'll celebrate 50 years as a practicing chiropractor. Wow. Um, <clears throat> I've been a practice management coach for almost 35 years. Uh, I got my first chiropractic adjustment after a serious fall when I was a kid. Fell off the monkey bar straight down on top of my head, knocked myself out. My dad thought I was dead. And when I was screaming, as I woke up under the monkey bars and my dad was running over to get me, he said it was the best sound he'd ever heard. Because I wasn't dead. (laughs) And and so they took me to the... um, uh, took me to the ER and I had a concussion and uh, they said I'd be okay. And I wasn't, I stayed sick for about a year. And so mm-hmm. finally a woman cornered my mother in a grocery store with her grocery cart blocking the way. Uh, and with tears in her eyes, begged her to take me to a chiropractor. Now this was a long, long time ago. And so chiropractic was anything but mainstream. And my, um, my mom and my grandmother took me to a chiropractor. I actually remember, I think, walking up the stairs when I was four or five years old. And my grandmother saw a cervical spine. And, uh, and she saw the bones. And she said, Kareen, this is voodoo. But then she saw this packed reception area. And she said, but if it helps, no, we'll stay. So I got my first chiropractic adjustment, and it was one of those miracle things. My dad said to my mom on the way home from my first adjustment, I think we've got our son back. And um, age 11, my dad told me after I had been under chiropractic care and knew and loved chiropractic care, and he said, you know, you're not too young to think about what you could do for a career, and you could be a chiropractor, and you could help people. And you could be your own boss and you can make a good living. I remember thinking, yes, I am too young. <laughs> but, I, but my dad, who never gave advice, I said, oh, okay. And that was it. That's how I decided to become a chiropractor. That's crazy. And I mean, this is, this is incredible too. I like that, um, you know, you, like, the, the chiro, like the, just chiropractic was instilled in you such, at such an early time and such an early age, and yet it stuck, didn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, it stuck for a couple of different reasons. Uh, we had great chiropractors, so we're wonderful people. And um, there would be four Lloyds and four Ludwigs and three Griffiths, and we would all come in and we'd all get checked and uh, Palmer HIO guys. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> I'd get adjusted or I wouldn't get adjusted based on me holding my adjustment. And, um, and, and we got chiropractic philosophy. Right. And, um, and my, Because of what chiropractic did for me, my parents virtually believed everything that they were told, which gratefully was the truth. And um, uh, I would, I, I benefited from chiropractic all my life. Mm. 
So um, I was not the youngest practicing chiropractor. I found out somebody was younger, but I was practicing in Washington when I was 22 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, and that was many, many, many years ago. Wow. So you, you, you must strongly believe that, you know, you know, the art science, but also that the philosophy of what we do as chiropractors is extremely important in practice. It's the rocket fuel that powers the ship. Mm. It's the thing that separates us from physical therapy and from massage therapy, all of which are good, but it's not chiropractic. You know, it's interesting too that you say that because there, to me, at some, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, I try to keep the temperature of what's going on in the profession in so many different you know, countries and places and things is like, I do too. I also feel like, you know, our philosophy is really what makes us so unique, but it's, it's the best part of it is it's a true, it's a, it's actually true. It actually <laughs> <laughs> conveniently, right? It's not a theory, you know? Right. Yeah. So is this something that you also, even with your, I know that like you're, we'll get a little bit more into this later, but with coaching, is this something that you really instill with also your clients that you work with? Yeah, my uh, kickoff hour on every single seminar that I do, at least part, has to do with the philosophy. Mm. Because if we have this esoteric philosophy that doesn't connect with reality, if this isn't the reason why um, kids who have ear infections or um, kids who uh, need mood-altering mood drugs because of ADHD, if people with allergies and people with migraines and people with all kinds of different symptoms and problems, if this isn't the reason why they get better, then we've got a problem. So there has to be an explanation of why the, the 65 year old man who's losing strength in his legs and can't work or the, mm. uh, the mid thirties mother who has migraine headaches, um, can't function in her family, the little baby, uh, who is sick chronically, um, and, and everybody else. I mean, it all comes back to one explanation, and that is that there's an innate and a universal intelligence, and it runs who we are, and chiropractors work with that in the spine. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it, 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 and, and as you mentioned, it's, um, it's, it's the reason why what we do works. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to go out on a, on a limb here and say yeah. that, you know, right now, and I have to be delicate when I say this, is I feel like there's a real opportunity for our profession to really step up and, and a lot more and be possibly less marginalized and become more mainstream because of the, you know, what's currently happening. And I don't want to, you know, date stamp this, this interview, but I feel like people are going to be looking for new solutions that they know that you know, there's, they're looking for solutions, right, for their health. They've been exposed in terms of how they're operating in their life and their diet and their function and their, and, and I feel like as chiropractors, we're equipped to help them. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Well, I, I, I really do agree. I, I think that, um, now this is what I've seen in my clients. My clients who've had their lives affected by chiropractic, they know that they know what they're supposed to know. There is this bedrock conviction. And quite honestly, they're not so concerned if they're being accepted in the mainstream as long as the person who needs them understands and accepts them and tells the story. And the people that I, that I, that I coach who have waiting list practices and busy associates and love chiropractic, waiting list practices, busy associates, and love chiropractic are those who also have a strong philosophy. And the, and the, and the chiropractor who's the most miserable and uh, the person who has so much stress is the person who is trying to integrate the medical with the chiropractic. Um, he or she is typically not a very happy camper. And, and I mean, I, and I coach people who have integrated practices and, you know, I, I I love them. I think they're they're great people, but a good number of them certainly have regretted that decision. Yeah. Well, the I mean, person I, who doesn't regret is the person who's philosophically oriented, um, um, loves their patients, does great work. Um, those people have more people 
to take care of than they can actually handle. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and, and I've even said it by myself, if I was to step back into practice, it would be using these like only, and right. you know, our philosophy relying on the philosophy and the, right. and the doctrine of what we, you know, that I was, that was really what, what was the reason that attracted me to chiropractic too. Right. I'm a chiropractor. I don't have a really great story from when I go like from what really young, unfortunately, but I just, yeah, the philosophy was what pulled me in. It just right. makes sense. It's funny. Like that's, it just made a lot of sense. Um, if you take 12, if you take 12 patients, uh, at wildly diverse uh, conditions and stories and histories, and you were to get them to tell their chiropractic story in three minutes each. The only thing that connects all 12 of those people is, mm. is chiropractic philosophy. Every single one suffered from the same problem, and that is subluxation. And every single person um, got better the same way, and that is detecting and removing the subluxation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's, I've never heard it said, like pointed out that way, but it's, it's completely true. Yeah. And yeah. so it's what I call chiropractic CSI, the crime scene <laughs> investigation. <right? laughs> it's the one common denominator. That's right. The one common denominator is the philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, let's face it, each person who adjusts is kind of like an, a Picasso, like a, they're, they're an artist at what they do. So every person may have a different experience, yet the result is always the same. And it's always from the same philosophy, right? They're not all Picassos. <laughs> I've adjusted, and I didn't know whether to call for an aid car or call the police. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, this is, this is true. This is true. Yes. Which, but we do try, right? We try yes, to, to up-level our skill. Um, okay, so one of the things we love to talk about here on The Philanthropist as well is quotes, positive words of meaning, affirmations. Do you have some positive words you'd like to drop on docs today? Well, um, I have what I call the trifold objective. Well, I've got a couple, but one is the trifold objective. Help people have fun, make money. And those become the markers. So number one, and this has to come first, you have to help people. This has to, this has to, you have to give more than you take. Mm. Um, you, you have to have people with right motives. I'm here to help people. Number two, it needs to be fun. By the way, if it isn't fun, you're doing it wrong. And if you're doing it right and it still isn't fun, then you're wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, um, and then number three, it has to make money. Um, so um, I, I've had people call me up and say, I'm just a money guy. I want you to tell me how to make my practice more profitable. And I'll ask that person a lot of questions. And if I don't like their motives, I won't work with them. Mm. Because it needs to be help, help people first. I mean, you have to have a heart to help people. But it also needs to be fun. This needs to be enjoyable, whether you're doing marketing or developing associates or training your team or the individual, what I call the power hour, which is the chiropractor functioning at his or her um, highest clinical efficiency and productivity. It needs to be fun. You need to set it up in a way that you can enjoy it. And if you didn't do that, you made a mistake. And that's one of the things that I help people with. But it also has to be profitable. We all know the bakery or the dry cleaner or the restaurant that had the great meals, the great pastries, or the great dry cleaning that just didn't know how to make a business of it. And so um, what we do as chiropractors is so valuable. If you have a good business model, not only will you help people and have fun, but you'll make great money. Mm. And then you'll have a good business model to bring associates into your practice and you teach them and, and they do well as well. Yeah. So that's called the trifold objective. I've got another one if you'd like. <laughs> sure, drop it. <laughs> Fall in love with the process and the results are assured. Mm. So if you fall in love with Cheetos, beer, the couch, and the remote control, you'll have to get a wheelbarrow for your butt. <laughs> but if you fall in love with high fiber, a low fat exercise, and you can fall in love with all of that, you can, you can, 
you, you can fall in love with the right things. I think love is a choice. So uh, then you get the results. Uh, I've been on the phone today with absolutely wonderful chiropractors that have fallen in love with the right processes and, and then they have, they have the fruit of those processes. Mm-hmm. So I think that we need to choose our loves and then love our choices. <laughs> Some really great quotes here. I like this. It's good stuff. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, that was great. I, I, I also love where you were, you're like you about, like I've always kind of thought of like, um, like it's an ecosystem, like you can't continue to take from the ecosystem, right? And expect it to flourish, like to, to give back. So that there has to be the give and take, right? And, you, and like you said, the, the, val- like the value of the, like what you put in actually has to outweigh what you take away. <laughs> um, right, right. Yeah, I love that. So, so Doc, what, um, what is a time where you may have experienced some struggle or challenge? And, you know, this is like one of those times where you fell flat on your face, by the way. And okay. like what you experienced from that, not only like the, the hardship of it, but like what was the lesson that you learned from it and how you apply it now to maybe coaching your clients or, you know, with yourself or personally or your business or otherwise? <clears throat> well, I had a, I had an absolutely gorgeous practice, 500 plus patient visits a week. I loved my practice and my practice loved me back. Um, I would leave the office at, on Friday high as a kite because I had just, I had seen all these wonderful people and, and had so much fun. Well, I was in Sun Valley and I was skiing behind some really, really good skiers. I think they were college students, two guys and a young woman. And uh, they were popping off moguls and I thought, well, I'll pop off moguls. Well, I did what's called a yard sale, if you know the term in skiing. In other words, yeah. it's such a crash that you're, goggles are over there and your poles are over there and your skis are up the hill. Oh, no. And, um, and I, I, I really, I knew that I hurt myself, but I skied off the hill. And, uh, later I lost all the strength in my right arm. I couldn't even support it against gravity. So I went to see a local chiropractor and he said, you're in trouble. You've blown some discs in your neck. You're going to have to check with a neurologist. And, and um, neurologist said that I was supposed to have a bilevel fusion, five, six, six, seven. And, um, and I decided not to, but I couldn't practice anymore. And I'd seen multiple different doctors and chiropractors and, and they said, no, you just can't do this. So I literally had to quit practice. And I remember lying in bed in so much pain and not knowing what to do, still, uh, thinking that it might degenerate into a surgical option, which gratefully, thank God it never did but I literally had to quit practice. Hmm. And, and I, had, I had to make a decision. And I remember, I remember where I was in the car on the freeway driving south on Interstate 5 when I decided that I was, that I was, gonna, I was gonna do what I needed to do in order to stay into chiro- in chiropractic. And, and, um, and I started developing associates at that time. Hmm. And um, now, that's about a two minute explanation, but it happened over a period of months. And, and I started to work on my skills and I, I, I investigated my business and I, and I thought I, I was seeing so many people and having so much fun and making so much money that I had some pretty sloppy business practices and I tightened mm-hmm. those up. But I, I really specialized in uh, interviewing, hiring and developing great associates. Mm. And that became my passion. I was able to help people because I couldn't practice anymore, but my associates could. So, I mean, I just, um, I've, I've had 70 plus great associates. I built 10 clinics and sold those to my associates. And most of whom I'm still friends with to this day. Wow. And I mean, um, actually, I, I did some research on, clearly on your, on your website and things like that before we got on the call today to kind of get a, a temperature as to what, how this conversation might go. But um, so is that, would you say that, like, I mean, cause there's so many resources, your, your website, by the way. So anyone who uh, would like to check it out, it's my five star.com. And uh, 
you have an, is it, is the associate ready practice? Is that the 26 point associate analyzer? Is that something a lot of docs should check out? Do you think? Right. It really is. So the successful chiropractor who loves his or her practice gets busy. And I know they're dirty little secrets. Their dirty little (laughs) secrets are they need help. Some of them have been injured for years, unable to take any time off in order to heal. Mm -hmm. Uh, They, um, they, they need freedom in order to be able to enjoy their success. And they, they, like I, think it's crazy that there's just one person producing services handling the whole overhead. Yeah. And, um, but associateships fail at an astounding rate. It's my mm-hmm. contention, and it's only my um, in, uh, empirical evidence, but I think that 85% of us, standard old school associateships end on a sour note. Wow. And, uh, and so what I believe is that there can be a win-win associateship. I did an interview of a young woman this morning who's in an associate with, associateship with one of my clients. And she's just back at work. Well, she's been back at work for a few months now uh, after maternity leave. And loves her associateship, never plans to change, is very, very driven, a wonderful chiropractor. But she's in a win-win relationship with her associate, uh, her, uh, the person who offered her the associateship. And I think, I think that you can do that. And there's um, a, a simple formula for putting that together. Mm. And more people should do that. Yeah. So that's what I specialize on, by the way, as far as coaching people. I know, you know, I'll be honest with you. Like I, I tried, I think two, three times bringing associates in, trying to find the right people, by the way, was, was not easy. And then, um, yeah, it didn't go well. (laughs) Yeah. It didn't go well. And by the way, you can be a great chiropractor. You can love chiropractic. You can be a great person, but if, uh, developing associates is in, inside the win-win model is is different. And by the way, it becomes fun and enjoyable, but there are things that seem intuitive that really aren't. In fact, I've talked to people before, and they told me what they were doing, and I said, well, here's what you should have done instead. And and people will tell me, well, now that I see it, I, I understand. I basically ruined my associateship. Wow. Uh, by what I was offering and what I did and what I didn't do. Yeah. Um, so there's a right way and a wrong way. <laughs> well, clearly I did the wrong way. Yeah. I was kind of spitballing it and going, well, this seems like a good deal. And then at the end I would be, you know, either w- someone would end up feeling that they weren't getting, you know, th- that there they wasn't a, a proper exchange or a value exchange or something like that. And um yeah, I love this too because it's it's definitely something that I think a lot of doctors need because they're looking for ways that they can, like you said, um, allow someone else to possibly come in as an associate and give them more time, more freedom, yet without compromising, you know, their feeling that they're going to lose something inside of their practice. Like that win-win is so important. So um, let me take an illustration from football. Um, I own the stadium. I own the team, I'm the coach, I'm also the referee and the cheerleader. I have a lot of jobs. <laughs> My associate is the player. Now, I'm a coach and I'm an owner. I want to win a Super Bowl. That's good for me, right? It's good for me financially, it's good for me prestige-wise. And my player wants to win the Super Bowl as well. And so we work together in a win-win relationship. And so I recruit people not to work for my goals in exchange for a paycheck. That's the old time for money model. But what we do is we pick, uh, in a Venn diagram, there's this intersection of wins. And uh, I want to help people have fun, make money, and they want to make money, and they want training, and they want a career opportunity. And uh, And we put this together in such a way where we do that together, where um, they they get super, super busy. We teach them how to do a day one, day two, how to do the marketing, how to stay in a patient-valued relationship, and that's called retention. Mm. And we give them opportunities to do that, and they're well-paid. 
but there's so much there's so much that goes into that so it, it's first of all i believe it's what's offered we have to have a true win-win offer and it's got to make sense business-wise for the clinic owner and the associate and um, and then there's this plug and play paint by the numbers system where really really good chiropractors can hire potentially great associates and have this great win-win relationship there was one young woman she sent me an email out of the last four years she had had a full year off 52 weeks during wow. that time she had two maternity leaves and a bunch of vacations and her associates collected an additional off new patients that they produced, $1.277 million. <laughs> While she was on a 17-week maternity leave, her associates were collecting record numbers. Mm. And this is not a small practice. This is a million-plus dollar practice. And the associate, how does the associate feel like this? Did they feel used and abused? No, they were thrilled. because. They were compensated, and she was compensated. It was a true win-win relationship. And I've got more stories like that than I can shake a stick at. Wow. Yeah. But the so, paradigm has to be right. It can't be the old time for money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like your analogy here with the, the football stadium owner, manager, coach. So right. it's like you have the playbook. It's like you have the playbook. <laughs> you do. You, you do. tell them how to run the play. And, and you have uh, you have training as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of the reasons that an associate will get hired, and then the the, um, the owner will give me a call and say, "What do I do with this guy?" They will you have what's your training program? What do you mean training program? I never had a training program, <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. You need to have a training program. You are for the position. Mm. So I want to see I want to see my associate profitable as soon as possible. I want to see him bone as soon as possible. I've, I've got to have a plan. If, if I don't have a plan before I hire an associate, I shouldn't hire an associate. Mm. Yeah. I love this. I mean, this is, this is, this is exactly what the kind of conversations I love that are so valuable inside of the chiropractic philanthropist podcast is that we get to, to bring up really a lot of the pain points and, you know, we, we know what the common pain points are for a lot of doctors. It's usually business or new patients or retention, but, you know, we, we don't have that conversation about associateships and how they can go sour so many times uh, and so many docs give up. I'm just going to drop your website here one more time. So it's my5star.com. And there's actually a blog section, section which has some incredible blogs on here and videos. So docs could spend quite a bit of time on your site here too. Um, if you're listening uh, on your mobile uh, doc right now, what you can do is actually open up your show notes and you can head over to thechiropracticphilanthropist.com and we'll have a web page dedicated to our discussion also with Dr. Noel today. And we'll have uh, all the links and resources he's providing. Um, Doc, so I'd love to take you and actually put you into what we call our T TCP time machine. Are you ready for that? I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so here's how it works. So I'm gonna put you in the time machine, okay? We're gonna send you back to a younger version of yourself. This is like you're 22, 21 years old, okay? You just graduated chiropractic college. You have all the knowledge and life experience that you have today. What advice would you give that younger self? Wow. I would say, um, well, one of the things that I would say, uh, because I made money, uh, I made tremendous amounts of money. And, uh, and I spent tremendous amounts of money. <laughs> Been there, and I bought two new cars in one day, two new houses in fourteen months. Um, I, I I owned an airplane. By the way, an airplane is a cure for too much money, and uh, so, so I would I, I I I would probably follow Dave Ramsey's mm. advice on money. Uh, Financial Peace University. I think David is a smart guy. Um, as far as chiropractic is concerned, um, I would. I would act like I would want the prototypical associate to act in my practice. And here's what I mean. Mm. I would treat the staff. I would treat chiropractic. I would treat the clock. I would treat my procedures. I would treat my scripts. I would treat my marketing just the same way that I wanted my associate to. Mm. 
I would want to be in my practice in such a way that any of my staff people could point to me and say to my associate, you do exactly what Dr. Lloyd does and you'll be fine. Now, I, I, I did that because I was, I was in love, I was in love with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to develop associates. So the first thing is to develop your day one, your day two, how to, oh, if, if everybody learned how to handle the top 24 objections mm. and, um, and the objections for, um, not starting care for not continuing care for, uh, so that you could build this wonderful practice. Now, you, you know your procedures, you're handling your objections, you're treating the clock, the staff, everything like you'd want your associate to. You're going to have this monster practice, but you will also be templating out exactly how you are going to train your associates. Hmm. And you can have, you know, I've got doctors that have eight to 12 weeks off a year and set records year after year after year after year. Wow. And they have wonderful associates, and those associates can come and they can leave. And uh, I've interviewed some of the doctors who used to work for my clients, and it was the best experience they could have ever had. I spoke to a young woman this morning who used to work with one of my clients. She's a client of mine now. And whenever she speaks about her experience with her clinic owner who did her associateship, she tears up. Mm. Because of the wonderful investment that that um, that chiropractor made in her life. Now that's Dr. Jamie Kramer, who had the clinic in Troy, Michigan, and that's Dr. Natalie DeBrownie, who now practices in Rochester, Minnesota. And um, so um, you 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 become a discipler. You become somebody who builds into the lives of chiropractors. And instead of having an associateship where somebody's taking advantage, taken advantage of, you're investing in somebody. And by the way, the, the business model is wonderful. The clinic director does very, very well in terms of help, freedom, and money. But mm. the associate does too. And so that's what I would say to the younger me. I would take what it took me literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours to develop and trial and error and all that mm -hmm. other stuff. I would, I would say, Hey, here's the book. <laughs> <laughs> here's the book. Here's, here's how to do it. And I would have started and I would have started earlier. Like from day one. Through. What's that? You would have started from day one. From day on one. Yeah. yeah. Preparing. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Cause that's the thing is we get to a certain point and then we're like, okay, well, I guess this is the next step, but we've never even considered been in that mindset of, you know, working towards having an associate actually come in. It's just like, right. okay, well, this is the next logical step or we're advised by a coach or mentor to do that. You have a business if you can. And I think that, I, I think that chiropractic is worthy of making it a very, very good business. And then that business delivers chiropractic care at the highest level. You know, great hotel chains have customer service uh, down, you know, like the Ritz, um, uh, or, um, or another hotel where it's just, it's just fabulous. You should have a business model that delivers chiropractic that way, and then have it be something that you can replicate. And then there will be people that will come and work with you for years. Now I've, I've heard this. If I teach my associate how to be so successful, they'll go out and they'll, and they'll be on their own. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes they do, but you know, it's my experience that if you give somebody a place where they can be super successful, they love that and they want to stay. And if they go out on their own, that's great. They, my associates who bought clinics for me or left, they became people that I could, uh, I, I could say to my next prospective associate, why don't you call uh, Joe Crisanti or why don't you call Steve Ball or why don't you call Craig Tuttle and ask them, how things went for them as a result of working with me. Mm -hmm. And if you treat people well, if you put them in a win-win relationship, you don't want to control them anyway. 
Yeah. Yeah. Fall in love with the process. Fall in love with the process and the results are assured. That's right. <laughs> I love it. And versus dread the process of the associateship. I, I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's true though. I mean, it's exactly just to kind of wrap up and bring in, in the entire conversation that we're having today is you have to fall in love with the process of bringing someone else into your, into your, into and your you know business. What? You can fall yeah. in love with the process a lot better if you know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yes. With that, if you know what the process is. <laughs> if you know what the process is, right, right, right. Awesome. So one of the last things we love to do is just really drop a resource on uh, doctors as well. Now, this could be a podcast you're listening to, um, could be, you know, some videos, uh, could be a book that you're reading or a book that you have read, something that you would love doctors to go and check out as well. Well, um, there, there are a couple books that I really like. One is uh, The Top 10 Mistakes Leaders Make by Hans Finzel, F-I-N-Z-E-L. And he talks about servant leadership. Mm. And um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great book. There's, a, there's another book called The E-Myth Revisited. And uh, Michael Gerber in the E Myth Revisited, he says, build the first business like it's the first of 5,000. Huh. And, um, and I never, I, 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 when I read his book, I felt like I came home. Hmm. Because, oh, oh, this is, this is what I was looking for here. And he talks about formatted businesses as opposed to uh, ma and pa shops. And you want to format the chiropractic practice to be help people, have fun, make great money, build it inside that model, and then teach others to do the same and facilitate their success while they're with you. And um, I, was talk I was talking to a guy today, Brian Morris, who is a client of mine, been a client for a number of years and has three wonderful associates. And one of the things Brian has said to me in the past is he said, is that every single day, one of the questions I ask myself is, how can I help my associates be more successful? Now, just imagine being an associate <laughs> in that <laughs> clinic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's right. Because, um, uh, and, and they're in a business model where Brian does fine. The associate does well. And um, here's this wonderful, wonderful, smart chiropractor who's learned the win-win associate system, mm -hmm. who's um, trying to do that. Now, I, you will learn how to do that better with Gerber's book, and you will learn how to do that better with Finzel's book. Mm -hmm. The E-Myth Revisited is, I think, the best version of the E-Myth books out there. And then the top 10 mistakes leaders make by Hans Finzel. Beautiful. Yeah, awesome. And actually, so what we'll do is we're going to drop those links uh, and resources. Uh, we have um, just a couple of minutes here before we wrap up, but I'll, I'll just drop the site one more time for docs who, surprisingly, we get a lot of people who listen on their desktop. It's uh, thechiropracticphilanthropist.com. And as you might notice, we've actually read on our website by this time, the time that this episode has dropped, we have a completely new, revised, modernized website. So thechiropracticphilanthropist.com will have a webpage dedicated to our discussion, all the links and resources you can click right from the site. Um, Doc, really enjoyed our conversation today. I love talking about a couple things. Number one, um, I love talking about chiropractic and philosophies, especially. Uh, I do love talking about money as well. Like I find... <laughs> It's something that not all doctors are comfortable about talking about, but I feel that, you know, what we provide is so valuable, we should be highly rewarded for it. And so. this new, you know, this rarely and uh, topic, you know, I've done 365 of these episodes, and I don't think that we've spent nearly enough time talking about associate relationships and, and, um, and how that can actually help doctors uh, in their practice and gain more freedom, essentially, too. So uh, thank you for that, for bringing your knowledge, your wisdom, but um, just a really great discussion as well today. So thank you for giving back. Truly, truly my pleasure. So you've heard the struggles, you've heard the successes, and this episode is done. But there's still so much more to come and so much more to learn. 
head on over to thechiropracticphilanthropist.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive free practice building tips and strategies, including how to market your practice with your very own podcast and so much more. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on The Chiropractic Philanthropist.